Getco News special coverage of the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference is brought to you by Snowline Gold. Hey everyone, I'm Jeremy Saffron. Welcome back to coverage over here at VRIC, the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference. Our next guest is here to break down not only the equity market, but specifically commodities. We know him well. He's a fan favorite. Rick Rule, thanks for coming on. Pleasure. Thank you for having me back. I appreciate this. And, and I want to kind of get into it from the beginning about the sentiment. I mean, it's been a busy show walking around these parts. Tell me what you're feeling from the investors. Tell me what you're having discussions with the listings. Uh, where are we at in this commodities market for this year? I think we're at a really interesting place. I think we're coming into a good market precisely because we're coming out of such a bad market and valuations are so low. Mm -hmm. My experience has been that you have to climb that wall of worry. And the wall of worry has been in place. This is unique because I think we're coming into a good market and there's a big crowd. I haven't seen this occur since 1990. Interesting. I mean, for a very, very, very long time. So the fact that you have both reasonable valuations and people ready, ready and willing to take advantage of it, it strikes me as being unusual and fairly good. Now, I need to say... Uh, my own preference is for markets that are hated. Right. As a check writer, I like low valuations. The fact that when I look around the hall, I actually have some competition writing checks from my own personal view is not good. But from the point of view of the market, of course, it's wonderful. Yeah. And when you think about the retail investors looking for guidance into this year, I mean, are they following this? Uh, are they following the evaluations right now? They're still not really stepping in and buying stock. The retail investor has been trained for a long time to buy narrative, mm -hmm. not arithmetic, mm -hmm. which is why the retail investor fails right. as a class. I don't know if you realize this, but in the last seven years, I've graded for free 80,000 retail portfolios. So I've learned an awful lot about the way retail uh, investors think. And unfortunately, while there's a subset of retail investors who do well, most retail investors follow the big picture. Yeah. While money is made, company by company by company. I think we're coming into a period for the next 18 months where the sector itself does well. It's important to note that if you look at this whole sector, probably only 10 or 15% of the companies are viable. Right. And if you stick with the sector rather than good companies, you will lose ultimately. You will lose. Interesting. So it's important that people know that. And do you think management is going to be just as important there then? Should that be something that investors are looking at their due diligence and saying, okay, where will this team take us? Management is where you look first yeah. before you do anything else. People don't understand, I suspect, that these are venture capital investments. They're, they're akin to technology investments. Mm -hmm. And it's all about the expertise of the team. It's all about the expertise of the team. Pareto's law, you know, 80% of, of the work being done by 20% of the population. What you learn is that that correlates at least for three standard deviations, which means 20% of the 20 do 80% of the 80, right. or 4% of the population generates 65% of the returns. Mm -hmm. Eight-tenths of 1% of the population generates 40% of the returns. If you as a junior investor hang around with serially successful people, you will make money. If you get outside of that, you will lose money. Interesting. So Simple. When you're talking about institutions, you're talking about some of that larger money coming in outside of retail. Are we at an interesting point in commodities where evaluations are low enough that some of these larger companies are going to start doing some acquisitions? Are we consolidating this market? Or are we growing more with this supply and demand mix? I think you asked me two questions, or maybe did. I didn't hear it. Did. I think the most important new investor in the junior sector will be established mining companies. Mm -hmm. They're generating a lot of free cash. Uh, they have pretty good balance sheets. They have underinvested in exploration for 20 years. Right. So they have no choice but to either joint venture or buy juniors. Right. The institutional investors who are generalist got burned very badly in mining in the decade 2000 to 2010. They're not going to come back in until it's too late. Yeah. Uh, that's just the way they are. Mm. They have a fondness for tops, which is wonderful. It gives us somebody to sell to. Yeah, it is true. You open up the market. Uh, yeah. Looking towards 2024, give me your outlook, gold and silver, before we get to the other metals. And I think gold will do well. Okay. Uh, gold moves generally on fear, and there's a lot to be afraid of. Uh, I mean, I think the, the broad economy is in good shape, but I think the U.S. government is doing the best job they can to debase the dollar. Right. And I think unusually for a government, they're being successful. Uh, I, I think there's a lot to be concerned with about the efficacy of U.S. dollar base savings. And I think the gold will benefit from that. People say that gold is breaking out to new all-time highs. That's silly. In, in inflation-adjusted terms, right. gold hasn't broken out at all. Gold has broken out against almost every currency in the world except the U.S. dollar. Mm -hmm. 
but I think that gold will do US, well in US dollar terms. In my experience, answering the rest of the question, silver moves after gold. Silver moves after gold has established momentum. What I like about silver is that it's roundly hated. The sort of silver squeeze, the, the sort of Reddit silver the craze. The step sibling. In 2021 generated a whole new generation that hates silver. Mm. Uh, jilted lovers, if right, you will. Right. Uh, and there is nothing that I like as much as a market that's hated. The silver equity market reminds me of the uranium equity market in 2022, which was stupidly cheap and had to be bought. So while I think I'm early on the silver trade, I can't help myself because I love hate. When I see the level of hate around the speculative juniors, I know I have no competition in the space. Interesting. Okay, well, you just brought up uranium. I mean, obviously, it's an interesting market right now with prices where they are. And you, I believe, called for a bull market in uranium last year when talking about it. So where are we at? Is it going to last? What's your thoughts? There's at least five years left in this market, but the easy money has been made. Yeah. We could have a 20-minute conversation on the changing structure of the uranium market and how that means that the way people invest needs to change, but we don't have time for that. The take home is this, if you were invested in uranium juniors, they're uniformly up 300%, 400%. When they moved from being hated to being tolerated, to being loved, the easy money has been made. Mm -hmm. So I personally, big, big, big speculator in the space, three years ago, I've taken my money off the table. I have a lot of uranium stocks left, but what I have left is just my profit. Interesting. The money I had invested in the sector, I've got that back. It's safe. It's in my genes. And the it's not going into more uranium. The structure of the uranium market is changing, which means that there's big money ahead of us, but the easy money has been made. Hmm. Okay, so looking at it from a 2024, 2025 perspective, we're watching population finally destigmatize uranium, mm -hmm. finally destigmatize nuclear energy. Is it because of that that we're seeing what we're seeing, or do we just have an energy crisis in the world that we need to figure out? Three things have happened. First of all, it got too cheap. Mm -hmm. It cost about $60 a pound, fully loaded, including cost of capital to produce a pound of uranium. Three years ago, we were selling it for 20. So you make the stuff for 60, you sell it for 20, you lose 40. Being a miner, you try and make it up on volume. Didn't work. Price of uranium had to go up or the lights would go out. It was that simple. Mm. People's time preference is so short that they didn't care about the arithmetic equation. They cared about whether a 20 cent stock was gonna go to 22 cents. They didn't give a damn about reality. They cared all about perception. Those people are my normal victims. Yeah. Right? Is, is there still a supply and demand pinch, though? I mean, there's a huge, huge, huge supply shortfall. What about lithium? Uh, different topic. Yeah. We'll get to lithium in a minute. What happened in terms of uranium is two things in supply. One, my former employer, Sprott, bought 50 million pounds of uranium. That supply went to supply heaven. Mm. The second thing that happened is that the Japanese, the other major source of supply, decided to turn on their nuclear fleet again. So that supply came out of the equation. We went from being massively oversupplied to having the spot market short uranium. Interesting, <laughs> interesting. And is that, I mean, where are they now? They're feeling the pinch. There is a pinch. The structure of the market is changing. It's going from a spot market to a term market. Investors haven't caught up with that. It has profound implications. The implications are bullish, but we don't have enough time to talk you through that. We can do that some other time. Okay. Let's go to 2016. We yep. saw that bull market. It ran for what? About six, seven months. A lot of analysts are saying that this one's going to be a longer commodity market. It could last a few years. What are your calls on that? My suspicion, I'm not an economist, I'm a credit analyst. My suspicion is that we have a real risk of an economic slowdown. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, an economic slowdown will not derail a commodity market, but it'll postpone it or make it less severe. Remember that you can have shortages of supply if you reduce demand and it doesn't move prices. Looking longer term, it is unescapable that there are 8 billion of us on the planet, that we're doing a wonderful job as a species, taking the 3 billion people on earth who are the poorest of the poor and increasing their material standard of living. Right. We will absolutely positively, without a doubt, without fail, have supply shortages and commodities. Will it occur in 2024, 2025, 2026? Probably not. Will it occur in 2028, 2029? Almost certainly. As an investor, you need to prepare yourself for that. So when you look at geopolitical situations, such as the Red Sea that's happening right now, we haven't quite felt the pinch. How do you, as an investor, plan for that? Are you looking at the oil market and you're saying, there could be some effects here? I'm not smart enough to do that. I don't play news. I play arithmetic. Yeah. When I look at the oil market, 
I look at the fact that investor perceptions are geared by politicians. Your prime minister, my president, are both dumb enough to think that peak oil demand occurs in 2030. Right. It's going to occur in 2065. Uh, when I look at statistics, uh, I learned that the oil and gas industry, public and private, is underinvesting a billion dollars a day in sustaining capital investments. Mm. What that means is that two years from now, three years from now, their ability to produce is impaired, right. which paradoxically raises prices. The political actions of oil's foes, like your prime minister, are in the oil industry investors' very best interest. The best promoter in the world for the oil industry is Justin Trudeau. Yeah. Uh, maybe seconded by that great energy physicist, Greta Thornburg. Right. Um, They're starting to realize the truth behind what we really require in order yeah. to flick the lights on. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Here's a great piece of arithmetic for your viewers. O over 40 years, uh, our species has invested over $5 trillion direct uh, into alternative energies. Mm. We've lowered the market share with $5 trillion from a high of 82% all the way down to 81 Right. $5 trillion. I'm not saying that there isn't room for geothermal, for solar, for wind. What I'm also saying is that oil and gas will be with us for more than the rest of my life, and I'm 70. Yeah, I mean, we saw it up in Canada just recently, obviously. We had uh, temperatures in different provinces reach very, very cold temperatures. As a result, the more power going to the grid, it started to fail. Right. It seems as though they're starting to clue in that we can't switch over by 2030. The big thinkers uh, want to believe, and they want you to believe, that it can. But the big thinkers are schooled in narrative, not arithmetic. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I hate picking on your prime minister. I only criticize politics in countries where I pay tax, but I pay tax in Canada. There you go. Uh, his background as a drama teacher did not equip him to understand the business case for Canadian natural gas very well. Right, well, let's talk about the other side of the equation over to Biden. I mean, you're going into an election year mm -hmm. in the U.S. Typically, historically, the economy does quite well in an election year. Where are we at? Probably the economy will do well because these guys will make insane promises and the voters will be dumb enough to believe them. Uh, I, I can't believe that either Mr. Biden or Mr. Trump would raise people's confidence but fortunately for the world economy, I'm not the average voter. Um, I think that you will see increased spending, irrespective of which president wins, which will be bad for your generation, but good for the economy. So I suspect that the U.S. economy will be stronger than people think in 2024. Hmm. The only thing that might derail that is if people actually watch the presidential debates and try and think, are either of these guys smart enough to run the country? Uh, would either of them be good for the country? I don't think anybody's going to vote for Trump. I think people are going to vote against Biden. Hmm. I don't think anybody's going to vote for Biden. I think they're going to vote against Trump. Yeah. And I agree with both decisions. I wouldn't vote for Biden. I wouldn't vote for Trump. But mercifully for the economy, uh, I'm just one little tiny part of it. <laughs> it's interesting going forward and kind of looking about the evolution. In terms of that, come back to commodities for a second. Where are you putting your money over the next two years? As an investor... Oil and gas is a no-brainer. Okay. And at age 70, I'm investing more than I'm speculating. Hmm. But as a speculator, I love hate. And the sub-100 million market cap space, which I haven't been in, really, for 10 years, because the price levels haven't rewarded me for the risk that the sector asked me to take, the price levels have fallen to the point where I'm even coming back into the sub-10 million market cap space. My talk tomorrow, after... 15 years of not talking about exploration will be about exploration. Hey. I'm doing it because people hate the risk associated with exploration. And if I had a motto in my life, it's I love hate. Uh, I want to be in sectors where I have no qualitative comp competition. Yeah, well, you're not daily trading it. So what is the outlook then? Are you thinking this is a two-year long-term or are you thinking this is a 20-year long-term investment? I think at least five. Okay. When I talk to the major mining companies, which I do all the time, mm -hmm. they tell me we haven't invested enough in exploration for 25 years. We don't have the human resources. We don't have the project backlog. We have to go to the juniors. We have to joint venture with the juniors, which lowers their cost of capital. Yeah. We have to buy successful efforts in juniors. That won't resolve itself in 2024. So you're around writing private placements. And for a lot of these juniors, how difficult has it really been? It's been way too easy. Way too easy. 
Hmm. And where is it going to be going then? I mean, you, you need to bifurcate. Yeah. If you look at the rank and file of juniors, what you learn is that probably 85% of them have no value whatsoever. But the investors have thrown the baby out with the bathwater. So you find very high quality companies with great assets, with great people, priced as though they're run by the lame, the halt, and the blind. Right. If you do the work to find those, uh, I think the next two years are going to be extraordinarily good. Anything about copper when you start to look into that sector? I'm almost commodity agnostic. Mm -hmm. I think over five years, copper does very well. We're using up the equivalent of one Bingham Canyon every year. We're finding one Bingham Canyon every 10 years. Uh, we are going to have ugly pinches in the copper supply. Will it occur in the next five years? Probably not. Does that matter to me? Not at all. Not at all. I love really big deposits, and I'm agnostic as to, as to what they contain. I like copper simply because it's treated me so well mm. over 40 years, and very often great big deposits, $15 billion plus deposits, are copper-centric. Yeah. And so for that reason, I like copper. You like it. You're, you're on the call. Okay, let's get over a little bit of dilithium. We talked about yep. it just before. We've seen that market stretch out, reach yep. some highs, come down to a correction territory. Yep. Where are we? I mean, it doesn't make sense with the supply and demand as well when it uh, comes to lithium. So where are we going? I think in the near term, lithium goes lower. Okay. Uh, I think that lithium, the lithium price exploded, not because there was a shortage of lithium, but rather because there was a shortage of lithium processing capacity. The industry's had four years to address that, and lo and behold, we have more lithium supplies. The industry now has been looking for lithium for 10 years. They never looked for it before. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, they found it. So you have a lot of development stage projects that will make money at today's lithium price. At the same time, new technologies have emerged, in particular, direct lithium extraction. If DLE works, it's over for lithium. That's it. I'm not saying it's gonna work, right. but if it works, Schlepp, Schmuck, and Schmo, Lithium Inc. is going to compete with ExxonMobil, and that will not be a fair fight. Hmm. I have been out of the lithium trade for about seven years because I, thought, I felt it was ahead of itself. I missed a very good market, except for owning SQM and Alba Marley, you know, the big right, ones. Right. I will now be looking at lithium because people are starting to hate it. I think you're going to find deposits that people have spent $300 million on that are worth $400 million, and sell in the market for 125 million. Yeah. When lithium gets hated, I'll be there. Interesting. I mean, it's already starting to begin, it seems, but we haven't got that bottom yet. Nah, people don't hate it yet. No. They will. They will? Yeah. Okay, we got to touch on bricks before I let you go. I know you're busy yeah. at the show, yeah. but when we talk about gold and we talk about the dollar, we have to acknowledge bricks as well as the oil industry. Yeah. What's the evolution going to look like over the next year? Is it something people should be at least keeping an eye on more than they are? Slow. Yeah. Slow. The U.S. dollar is the worst currency in the world, with the sole exception of every other currency. currency. The U.S. dollar is the most liquid and most transparent market in the world. There's no substitute for it. The BRICS countries don't trust the U.S., but they trust the U.S. more than they trust each other. Right. Uh, so I think that you'll see the U.S. dollar be the, the world's reserve currency for a very long time. I think that U.S. dollar hegemony is over. I think that the American people and the American Congress have done the impossible, which is to say they've debased the best franchise in the world. But there's so much ruin left in the U.S. dollar that the forecast of its demise is amazingly overstated. Something like 95% of the external debts in the world are denominated in U.S. dollars. Demand for U.S. dollars continues simply as countries uh, extinguish right. those debts. At the same time, debt issuances around the world are 93% in U.S. dollars, which is to say that a borrower's cost of capital, if they can afford to pay back in U.S. dollars, are cheaper than in any other currency. Hmm. The anti-dollar narrative, for the time being, while funded in fact, is just narrative. Yeah. It ignores current arithmetic. Okay, so there's no fundamentals that we should be concerned about in the near term. Well, the fundamental is that the U.S. government is doing its very best to debase the currency, right. and they will be successful. Right. But the timeline, Long. not worried about bricks. Long. Now, there's no substitute. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Uh, oil market, I'm curious, when you watch the Red Sea and what's happening, how much uh, attention are you paying to that? None. Okay. None. Uh, what I'm paying attention to is net present value at today's prices and sustaining capital investments. Mm. Long term, yeah. they're up. And both of those tell you that this is going to be a very good business for a very long time. 
If you look at businesses that are constrained by their government, as an example, the Canadian natural gas industry, yeah. they are still making so much money that companies like Pato can pay an 8% dividend. Yeah. And they pay it after they're investing enough money to sustain production. These are insanely good businesses yeah, they almost, probably only get better. They almost priced them in. I think Whitecap, they can, they can sustain their dividend to about a $50 yep. crude price, which right. is still a ways to go. Yep. So yep. that's a smart trade here. Yep. I agree. Smart holding. For investors. Yeah. For people who are hoping for triples, quadruples, 10 baggers, they don't want to be in the oil space. Yeah. For people that want to generate a 15% return on capital employed uh, and be able to reinvest it if they want for the same return on capital employed for five years, oil and gas space is a great space. And you don't need to come down to the little names. You know, in Canada, you can buy ARC. Uh, you can buy Freehold Royalty. You can buy Pato. You can buy Tourmaline. Uh, you can buy Birchcliffe. Uh, you don't need to get down into the penny dreadfuls. No. In the United States, you could buy Exxon uh, for an investor. Is this the bottom? Like, are we? Probably not. Yeah. If there's a recession, it goes lower, but it doesn't matter. Stuff is too cheap. I love it. Well, well said. And I could sit and talk to you all day, Rick. I know that it's a busy day. So thank you for coming on. A pleasure. I appreciate this. And thank you to our audience, obviously, for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more. I'm Jeremy Safran, and we'll see you next time. Gitco News special coverage of the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference is brought to you by Snowline Gold.